Welcome. Welcome to everyone who watches this video. And thank you for your interest. I will give a, you a brief introduction to the following interview with an outstanding and inspiring, a charismatic woman, the internationally known Israel feminist and pacifist, Alisa Shaili. It is an exceptional pleasure and honor for me as a former director of the Ali Salomon Archive in Berlin to welcome you, dear Ali Shalvi in Jerusalem, to this virtual room today. I thank you very much on behalf of the Ali Salomon Archive. We are doing this interview in the context of a project which serves to secure and re research the sources of the Jewish members of the School for Social Women's Work, the school which Ali Salomon founded at the beginning of the 20th century. Some traces of this research lead to mandatory Palestine in the 1930s, where emigres took part in the nation building. Traces that you, Alice, followed later. I also welcome you, Noli Lapin Eppel <laughs> from Vienna. Hello. Thank you for hello. Thank you for mm. recording this interview, especially on the background of your diverse historical research on recent Jewish history in Europe and the Shoah at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. In addition, you have been involved in the feminist network Beat Deborah since 2001 and since 2015 as a board member. It was here you met Ali Shalvi for the first time in 2001. I'm very happy that we have Ali Shalvi as our honorable special guest in the 20s year of the Ali Salomon Archive and at the completion of the project already cited. It's not the first time that Ali Shaibi has been our special guest. She was it for the first time when we opened the archive to the public 19 years ago. Ooh. It was her <laughs> who gave this wow. event. Yes, it was her who gave this event shine and underlined its special significance by emphasizing the historical, political, and ethical responsibility. Ali Shalvi was the first winner of the Ali Salomon Award, which is dedicated to women who fight for women's rights and social justice. I would like to mention Nicola Galina, initiator of the Berlin Jewish Film Festival and Christine lavonté rosé former rector of the Ali Salomon University of Applied Sciences. It is due to their encouragement that Ali Shalvi visited Germany again, even though she didn't want to, after she and her mother and her brother had left had fled Germany in 1934 after a year of fear and poverty. Ali Shaibi was seven years young. In England, she attended school and universities, studied English literature and social work. In 1949, Alice, who grew up in a Jewish Zionist family, decided to move to Israel, live there, and work as a social worker to help build the nation. But teachers were needed. Alice became a teacher and soon a professor of English literature at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In addition, she set up the English department of the newly founded University of the Negev, the nowadays Ben-Gurion University. Even today, she occasionally helps students understand and interpret Shakespeare's dramas. This career on its own is remarkable as part of the story of a young woman in the 1950s and 60s. 
However, her social and political engagement is much broader. Ali Shavi was and is committed to the liberation and emancipation of women. As a volunteer school principal, she helped set up and develop the Pelech School, a unique progressive high school for religious girls in Jerusalem. Today, this school is one of the 10 best schools in Israel. Ali Shalvi fought for equal rights for women, both in the synagogue community and in society at large. She became the first female director of the Werner Schechter Institute for Jewish Studies. And she combined all these functions and activities with a struggle for peace together with Palestinian women. Alice was always active at the national and international level and at the grassroots level, working out what she thought and taught. Alice Shalvi is both the mother of six children and the central figure who initiated and shaped the Israeli women's movement. No wonder that she has received many awards and accolades in Israel, in the United States of America and Europe. After all, Ali Shalvi is not just a politically, religiously and socially active woman. In addition, she is a passionate admirer and patron of the arts. She manages to bring all the different aspects together and extraordinary, an extraordinary ability that is also characteristic of Ali Salomon. Due to the initiative and support of Ali Shalvi, one of the very, very few operas were created that deals with the Shoah, with the everyday fears and worries, communicate them and make them tangible. One basis of this opera are the letters from Ali Shavi's mother, letters which she, the mother, wrote to her husband in England from 1933 to 34, while she was fearfully waiting for the exit permits for herself and her children, William and Alice. At this point, I will leave the stage and head it over to Norli lapin Eppel and Alice Shalvi herself. Thank you very much for your intention. And I'm looking forward to the interview in which Alice Shalvi will also read from her recently published memoirs. And I will show you these memoirs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you once more. Thank you, thank you Ariadne, for the, for the introduction. And thank you, particularly, Alice. It's an honor for me that I am allowed to interview you. Now, Adriana has introduced your memoirs. They've shown it to our audience. So my first question also is with regard to these memoirs and to its title. In, the, in your book, you have a chapter that is called Homecoming, and it deals with your aliyah, with your moving from England to Israel. And yet you have the somehow surprising title, Never a Native. Uh, could you please explain this to us? Why were you never a native? You lived in so many countries. Why never a native? Well, I think you've put your finger on the spot. I lived in so many countries, um, and I was never actually a part of the society of that country. I was always an outsider, an alien, uh, even when I got to Israel. And I think I'd very much like to read a short passage from the book, which I call Border Incident, which I think illustrates at least a part of this sense of 
not really belonging anywhere in particular. It's an incident which took place in 1946, in the summer of 1946, when I went with my parents uh, to Switzerland to a place as close to the Italian border as possible in the Swiss Engadine, uh, because we were hoping to go to Italy as well in order to meet my youngest aunt, my father's youngest sister, who had escaped the Holocaust by being in hiding together with her husband and her son with Italian peasant. And uh, we had to cross the border. That was in the days when, uh, before the European Union, when you had to show a passport, you had to have a visa. And we arrived at this little uh, border. It wasn't really a frontier post. It was a very makeshift post. And there was a young soldier. Uh, my parents went first, presented their passports, didn't have any problem at all. But when he came to me, he looked at the passport and looked at my face uh, as if to check whether this was really my passport, whether the photograph was a photograph of me. And then he said, Parli Italiano, I nodded, hoping against hope that the vocabulary that I had acquired at Newnham, which was the college I studied at at Cambridge, during the previous summer's course in Dante and Boccaccio, would prove adequate. Polaka, he asked. The word was not in my lexicon, but I recall my parents referring to their non-Jewish neighbors as Pollocks. The appellation clearly didn't apply to me. I shook my head. Senata in Polonia, he persisted, assuming from my momentary hesitation that I hadn't fully understood his previous question. No, I said, pointing to the place of birth in my passport, Essen, Germany. Dunque tu sei tedesca. It was so categorical a statement that I felt considerable embarrassment in contradicting it. No, I was born in Germany, but I'm not German. I switched to English, having finally realized that the summer course had not prepared me for altercation with the Italian military. Ah, he said thoughtfully, as if reflecting on what was to all intents and purposes utterly incomprehensible. He switched track. Dove vivi? I live in London, Inglaterra. Ah, say English. He pronounced it with a very long E. English. But I had to disappoint him once more. I was in despair, slowly pronouncing each word as distinctly as possible. I said sadly, no, I'm not English. I just live in England. A long silence ensued. He studied the passport, generously granted to my stateless parents by the Polish government in exile, then resident in London. Finally, overwhelmed by the lack of clarity, the contradictory details, he went off to find a more senior official. So that was it. I, I wasn't German. I wasn't English. We didn't receive British nationality till after the war, because during the war, the British were not naturalizing people who'd come, even though we qualified already for British nationality. And so I had this Polish passport without being in any way connected to Poland, except for the fact that my parents had been born 
in that part of Austria, Austro-Hungarian Empire, which later <laughs> became And then when I came to Israel, where I really feel totally at home, at last I, I felt this is where I belong. This is my homeland. This is where I've always dreamed of living from a very, very early age. I discovered that because I hadn't been born here, and because I came from an English-speaking country, which was fairly rare, and most of the inhabitants, most of the people, citizens of Israel had come from Europe, from the mainland, from Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Uh, the British, those who'd come from the United Kingdom, were a fairly small minority. And we were called Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> you know, and, oh, you're Anglo-Saxons, if we were sort of different from everybody else. So I, when I was casting around for a title uh, for my memoirs, I suddenly realized this. I, it was the first time I'd become really aware of the fact that I had never actually belonged in the place where I lived, and that even in Israel, even though I speak Hebrew fluently, I teach in Hebrew, I lecture in Hebrew, I speak publicly in Hebrew, I speak Hebrew with my children, Nevertheless, I'm still labeled an Anglo-Saxon. I'm not really, because I wasn't born here, or because I didn't come before the state was established in 1948, which I think is the cut-off date. You know, I don't really count as a true Israeli. So hence the, the title, Never a Native. Uh, and it's a very strange feeling because uh, on the one hand, this is my home. I have no other home. This is where I've lived now since the age of 22. It's where I made my career. It's where I married. I met my husband here. We married here. We set up a family. I have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren who were all born here. And yet the sense that I have come from a different culture, a different background, is still very strong. I'm sure this is partly because my whole professional career at the university was in English and English literature. And it's really, I would say, the culture in which I grew up. If I'm asked what is my mother tongue, I would say English. Right? Well, it's not my mother's tongue mm. at all. Right. So the sense of uh, always being an alien, always somehow foreign, is, I think, very much part of my character, of my life, as I think is true of very, very many of the um, those who came from Germany even before the establishment of the state, uh, who came when they were already adults, when they had already absorbed uh, their very much European identity. So that's a long explanation of why I call this <laughs> never a native, but it's a very essential part of my existence. It is, and uh, I now would like to come back to maybe the most tragic part of your biography, and that's your childhood in Germany and your flight to England. Um, in your memoirs, you write most of the, mostly about the problems your mother had waiting for the entry visa to England. 
But in an interview you gave, I heard that you had many more childhood memories about the, the Nazi takeover in Germany, about the persecution that you as a child only half understood. Could you please elaborate on that? Well, uh, as a child, I really didn't understand what was going on. Uh, my parents did not talk politics in front of me, but I sensed apprehension. Um, I stupidly stood at the entrance of our house when Göring came to Essen, which is where I was born, and uh, I waved enthusiastically. I had no idea what was happening. My parents didn't say anything. They knew I talked a lot to everybody, to any, any stranger I would talk to. And clearly, they were worried lest I say something which would reveal the fact, I don't know what, that we were Jewish. I don't know what. But then the, my first sense that I had, there were two incidents which are very, very clear in my mind. One of them was at standing at the kitchen window with my father in the winter. It must have been the winter of 33. Uh, and seeing red spots in the snow outside, I didn't even realize, uh, I was six, six and a half, I didn't even realize that it was blood. But hearing my father say, they got the communists. I didn't know what communist was. I had no idea. But that moment at the kitchen window is so clear in my memory that I must have sensed that this was something extraordinary. And then that became more visible in the home when I returned home from school one day and found all my toys and books, which I kept in a cupboard in the kitchen, strewn on the kitchen floor and learned. Again, I wasn't told explicitly, but you know, there are things that children absorb, feel, sense without being told explicitly, that our house had been searched. It had been searched for two reasons, mainly. Uh, my father was very active in the Ostjüdische Gemeinde, and he was equally active in Zionist affairs. Uh, and I assume that this made him suspect in some way. In any case, very soon after that, my father left. Uh, and after that, we moved to Mannheim, where my aunt, my oldest aunt, my father's oldest sister, lived with her family. And I had no idea why we moved. Again, I think I was overprotected because of the fear that I would blurt out that we were waiting to join my father in England. My mother had anticipated that we would get the entrance visas to England very rapidly. In actual fact, it was 10 months before my father was able to persuade the British authorities to give us entrance visas. It wasn't until May 1934, 10 months after he'd left Germany, that we were able to join them. And it was really only through the discovery of my mother's letters right, that I learned, my brother and I learned, of the terrible, I don't know, distress that she had been in. Because as an Ostjudin, she was in constant danger of being deported back to the East. Uh, together with us, together with her mother. Uh, and we just had no idea, even though my brother was already almost 13 years old, 
and even though he had gone with her several times from Mannheim to Frankfurt to appeal to the British consul to expedite our visas, right, and he actually wrote the reports to my father on those visits to the consulate, he must have been much more aware, obviously, of what was happening. But I was not part of that knowledge at all. I only knew that my father was gone, that I was longing to see him again. I'd forgotten what he looked like. My mother wrote to ask him to send a photo because I'd forgotten what he looked like. Uh, so I wasn't aware of what was going on, but the agony that she expresses in these letters, the tension, the waiting, she had to ask him to send back winter clothes, which she'd already sent off to England because she had not expected to spend another winter in Germany. Uh, the distress was so intense and the the most memorable sentence I will never forget from those letters, and there were many such sentences. Will I ever kiss you on the mouth again? Because of course she signed off, viele Grüße und Küsse. And then she added on one occasion, will I ever kiss you on the mouth again? And that sense of terrible despair, which as a child, I, I knew she was unhappy. I knew she was unhappy in my aunt's household, but I had no, no real understanding of how, what an agony she must have been in during those months of not knowing whether we would ever be together again. But I can't say that in Mannheim, I felt any sense of being, I felt any sense of being in danger. I didn't go to school. My brother and I didn't go to school because we were officially not in Mannheim. Uh, my brother was very active in the Zionist Youth Organization. He was a passionate Zionist. Uh, but I just was at home and miserable and uh, not very much liked by my cousins, not really part of the family there. And I can't say that I have any vivid memories of in Mannheim of it being a time controlled by the Nazis. So in a way, you were lucky that you were sheltered by your mother from all the all, all this all the terrible things that went on all around you so you came to <clears throat> england and england also soon became a theater of war and you were in the middle of it living in london yes well england was we came we were among the first refugees to come from england we were a novelty, you know, in 1934. Uh, I went, I was taken to school. I didn't know a word of English. It was very traumatic at first. Um, and I was introduced to everybody as our little refugee girl. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I learned English very quickly. Uh, and fortunately, I became the best in the class at English. I came from a more, I think, a more literate family than uh, most of the other pupils. Um, but I was Jewish. Uh, I was different. I kept the Jewish holidays and uh, the teachers didn't always understand why I had to be absent from school. So still that sense of being different and being a stranger was there. But I can't say that early on um, I suffered, I suffered consciously from anti any anti-Semitism. That came a little bit later. 
uh, actually during the war years, when for the first time, as I was in the schoolyard, two boys shouted, whispered, shouted, <laughs> said to me, mm. uh, dirty Jew. Mm. And I have never encountered that before. You know? uh, we were living in the countryside, uh, and we were the first Jews, those who arrived as evacuees from London during the Blitz, was, which was when my family moved from London into the countryside. Um, no, the, the villagers had never met a Jew before. And I discovered for the first time that anti-Semitism can exist even where there are no Jews. And that came as such a shock to me. You know, very primitive anti-Semitism. You killed Christ. Right? Uh, and I tried to deal with this in a rational manner. I got my father to supply me with literature about the Jewish contribution to civilization. I was very, very naive, very, very innocent. Um, but that, that was really the first time that I felt a real sense of being a total outsider, not only not only in coming from another country, because it couldn't no one who talked to me could think that I was not English born, right? But a sense of really being because of my religion an outsider. And that became even stronger uh, when I got to Cambridge where everybody was highly educated, and particularly the women, because it was very hard for women to get into Cambridge. That was where I first discovered the sort of latent upper class anti-Semitism, the sense of not being one of us, as the British would say, right? Different, particularly because I was an observant Jew. I only eat kosher food, uh, so that in the college where we ate, I was together with a few other Jewish young women who also practiced kashrut. We were different. We didn't eat the same food. When meat was served, we were given a piece of cheese. Um, and the it wasn't that there was anything um, anti-Semitic specifically said, but the sense you're not one of us. Uh, and that was further emphasized by my tutor at Cambridge. The tutor is the person who's considered in loco parentis, like your parent while you're uh, at college. Uh, who was really a pro-Arab, philo-Arab. Uh, Oriental studies was her subject. She taught Arabic. She was very, very much identified with the Arab causes. Uh, and she, she knew I was a Zionist. And uh, she would very deliberately taunt me by turning the subject of conversation to Palestine and what was happening in Palestine. Uh, this was between um, 1944 to 1948, when the fight for independence in, in uh, what is now Israel, in Palestine, became more, in, more and more intense, leading up, of course, to the terrorist activity uh, of the Ilgun Svailumi, who saw really would the, the, very, the very title of that organization is the association of a nationalist army, right, who unlike the Haganah, 
took a very, very aggressive militaristic stand vis-a-vis -vis what they saw as British occupation of Palestine. And so British soldiers were being killed. Uh, there were mass sabotage attacks, even by the Haganah, which was the more, the less extreme arm of resistance to the British. And um, that was when I really realized the extent to which I was an outsider because I identified with the Zionist cause and because I was known in my college as being not only a Jew but a Zionist, I was really ostracized by my non-Jewish colleagues. Um, again, strengthening my sense of not belonging in this society. It was very difficult. I was young. I was 18, 19 years old. I didn't feel that I could argue with my tutor. Uh, and I, I felt trapped. I really felt trapped. So that when I finally decided to come to make that break with England, you know, by getting a profession which I would be able to practice in the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, as we knew it before it became the state of Israel. Um, it was only then that I realized I have to go, I must go, and I must go with a profession which will equip me, I thought at the time, to deal with the those who had been through the Holocaust, some of whom I'd met, encountered already in 1946, which was when I first met a group of youngsters, 16, 17 year olds, who had been through the Nazi occupation of Eastern Europe. Um, and although they had not been in concentration camps, at least most of them had not, uh, they, had, they were displaced persons. They were not called Holocaust survivors of the time. That, uh, that term came much later, displaced persons. And I was so shocked by their behavior, which was, which was animal-like their desire for food, their lack of interest in anything except food and cigarettes, and then women. I was appalled, absolutely appalled. I hadn't expected, I, I didn't know what to expect, but I hadn't expect something like what in Yiddish is called wildechaias, <laughs> wild animals. Yeah. Uh, and then I decided that's what I want to work with when I finally get to the land of Israel. And so I switched from English literature, which God knows what I expected to do with after I graduated. I took English literature because I loved English literature. Uh, and I studied for two years at the London School of Economics and Social Work uh, and went to uh, what was then already Israel in November 1949 as a qualified social worker, only to discover that there was no work for me because, and this was very interesting, the whole post-Holocaust site Psychosis did not burst out until about 1944, 19, 1954, 1955. It took time. And only then, and, and I, I find this fascinating, did this did the after effects of the Holocaust experience of those who'd survived really begin 
to take a form which required actual treatment, psychological, psychiatric, psychiatric social workers. So I found myself without a job. Uh, and Alice, before, let me interrupt you just for a moment here. Before we turn to Israel, I would like to ask you to go back to England. You have yes. shown us the problems you had as a Jew, the problem with anti-Semitism, but in your autobiography, you also describe your, your childhood, your youth in England as quite happy, particularly in the countryside after the Blitz. Yes. Uh, ironically, <laughs> ironically, the war years living in the country were among the happiest of my life in England. We were in a very quiet village about 50 miles from London, uh, quite safe in terms of not being within the range of bombing or on one night a German bomber dropped some incendiary bombs in our garden, so there was a little fire, but it was nothing. We left, uh, we left London really at the height of the Blitz in November uh, 40, 1940. And from that point on, we lived in the countryside and I was very happy. I love English nature. And that was really what brought me very close to English poetry, English literature. Uh, it was idyllic. Uh, apart from the anti-Semitism, <laughs> uh, which I, you know, that's, uh, I think I now realize was endemic at the time. The, 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 British, the British don't like what they call foreigners. You know, you remain common. Britain has changed completely, of course, now with all the mass immigration, uh, including from the, what was the British Empire, the British colonies. It's completely different. But in those days, it was far more purely Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> uh, and I, I really had a wonderful, wonderful four years in the countryside. Um, I was expanding my knowledge. I was studying European history. We had two, we had two very good teachers. One in Eng well, one wasn't very good. One was good in English, but we had a wonderful history teacher, who was herself a graduate of Cambridge and encouraged us to try to get into the two major universities, Oxford and Cambridge. Um, which the school did not prepare for because they didn't teach Latin, but we managed to persuade someone who was also a graduate of Cambridge to teach us, give us private Latin lessons. It was, I have a sense when I think back to those years, uh, the last four years of the war, of it always being summer, being summer, <laughs> being outside, being in the countryside, picking blackberries. Uh, it was blissful. And uh, it's ironic. And then I discovered, then I met the, the DPs. And then I learned about the Holocaust. And then I learned also that one of my uncles and his wife and their three daughters, one of whom was a little bit older than me, one of whom was the same age as my brother, had all been shot in the Vov in the streets early on when the Nazis were still using shooting as a way of eliminating the Jews. And I had this terrible, terrible sense of guilt. What was I doing having a happy time when this was going on in Europe? And we didn't, we didn't know. My father knew. My father knew very early on because he was very active in the Polish Jewish community, which was, of course, in touch with the Polish government in exile. 
he actually broadcast on BBC overseas service in Polish during the war. So he knew what was going on, right, because word had got out. Uh, and he didn't, he kept us safe from this. And I understand that, but it meant that when I learned about it, as I say, it came as a terrible shock and inspired this very, very strong sense of guilt, which I still carry with me. You know, the, there but for the grace of God go I. I could have been there. It might have happened to me. Um, so I think that, I think I will never essentially overcome that, you know, sense of uh, deep down guilt and the need to atone for it, need to atone for it by but I think this really motivated me by social action, by creating a better society, by trying to create a world in which hatred will be eliminated, in which there'll be equality, in which there'll be love, humanity, humaneness. And that is, I think, another reason why I turned to social work. It was specifically because of that encounter with the DPs. But really, it was my sense, <laughs> my very naive sense of always wanting to engage in what in Hebrew is called tikkun olam, mending the world. It's also something I inherited from my father. Uh, who was very, very active socially, and who was, I think, like me, essentially a naive believer in the possibility of making the world a better place. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's uh, when, when you try to work out what ones, what your influences are, what, what are the little streams that come together to make the river of your life, right? There's so many different streams, and they're very different. It's the experience of anti-Semitism. It's the experience of not having been involved and the sense of guilt of not having been a victim of the Holocaust, uh, and essentially, I think it's a belief, it's a profound faith in which I still have. I mean, I, I feel very sometimes very stupid and naive, but I have great faith in human possibility of creating a better world. The question is how we do it, how we go about it, in what way we can overcome the hatred, which is so deep, so profound, and which seems to be increasing, the nationalism. You know, when, we, when I think back to 1945, the creation of the United Nations, what a dream that was, right? A dream of a world in which nations would cooperate. And now we see we're back, increased nationalism, increased hatred of the stranger, more wars, more internecine wars, splitting up of countries, splitting up of families. And one, one is tempted to despair it's very, it's very hard to remain hopeful, you know. Our national anthem is called Hatikva, the hope. And it ends with the words, uh, we have not yet lost our hope of creating, of being a free people in a free country. 
And although there's been a lot of pressure to change that national anthem, because it does exclude the Palestinians, right? It's very much a Jewish national anthem. I still feel the strength of that. What does it really mean to be a free people in our country? What is being free? Is it being libertine? Is it being anarchist? No. Or is it being able to make the most of yourself, of your gifts, of doing the most to help other people to fulfill their promise, to fill to the utmost what their potential is, right? I still believe that. I still believe in the relevance of those last words of the, of the anthem. And I don't give up hope. I may be, I'm sure I'm considered very naive by a lot of people. Uh, I sometimes think I'm being stupid. You know, what's the difference between naivety? And... <laughs> There's a marvelous line in King Lear where the bad son says about his good brother, a brother who is so far from doing evil that he suspects none. Right? He's himself so innocent that he can't believe that anybody should be less innocent. Well, I'm not quite as naive as that, right? I know that evil does exist, but I still, I still am an idealist. I still have hope. And I would like to feel, but I realize it may not be being very realistic, that precisely this period of the whole world being caught up in a pandemic, there isn't a single country in the world that has been spared. I mean, some of them, some of the countries have had fewer cases, have been able to deal with it, uh, with the pandemic more successfully. But this should be a wake up moment for us. What have we done to create a world in which there is such disease? I see the symbolism of this pandemic as indicating that we could, we could turn it into the beginning of a better period, of changing the way in which we live of changing the way in which we relate to envir environment, the way in which we exploit our environment. Right? It could be. The question is, where is the leadership coming from that is going to bring about that turning point? Right? If I can judge by Israel, we have a wonderful, wonderful civil society. Really, the number of voluntary activities, voluntary organizations, civil rights organizations, every sector, every sector in the country has its organizations working to improve, working to mend the world, tikkun olam. But I'm not seeing the leadership emerging from that, at some point it has to take a political form. At some time, at some point, it's not enough to be social activists. Right? You have to take control. And the question is, how do you take control? And this is the basic question that I see in, in human life. And I find it expressed so wonderfully in Shakespeare, particularly in Hamlet. How do you fight evil without using the tools of evil? And this 
this for me is the essential dilemma. How does good overcome? Let's put it very bluntly, without going into politics. <laughs> but maybe what you just mentioned is one of the reasons why you're hopeful. And you mentioned Israel's vibrant and wonderful civil society. And if there was a person who helped develop this civil society, it was you. And it was you, and actually what is most interesting, from your standpoint of an English teacher in the beginning. So maybe let's turn again to your career in Israel, to your work as a teacher, as a teacher at the university and at schools, and as an activist. Well, um... As a teacher, I very much adopted the Cambridge approach to literature. Uh, we had uh, one examination paper in each of the three years, which was entitled Life, Literature and Thought in a particular period. First it was the medieval period and so on, until the modern period. And I think that combination, not just literature, if we were not just analyzing texts, right, but the bringing together of life as it was being lived, history, social history, right, and the way in which it is reflected in or even created by the social background and the political background right? and the philosophical background. This uh, holistic approach guided me in all my teaching. When I taught literature, I taught it as a philosophy, as a way of life, and not only strictly from a point of literary analysis. And I think that's one reason why I was so attracted to Shakespeare, because for me, he is the essential uh, creator of literary works which deal with, which embody the most existential issues in life. And again, I would point to Hamlet and King Lear as the two outstanding examples of this trying to find the answers to the essential questions in life. What is it makes evil? Right? Where does evil come from? And how does one cope with evil without using the same tools as evil uses, because it's symbolic that when Hamlet finally commits the act of justice, as it were, right, and kills the murderer, he does it using the tools which the murderer pre prepared to kill him with. How do we fight evil without becoming evil ourselves? And I think that this, in everything I taught, the, the philosophical existential issues led me to bring, these, to bring these issues into my conversation, my dialogue with my students. And I believe in education essentially as being a mode of helping the individual, including the teacher, including the instructor, to find his or her path through life, to find the answers to the essential existential questions. And then when you find the questions to seek the answers. And I did that in my teaching at the university. I did it in, at the school, at my school for girls. I made them question 
the role of women in Judaism, the inferior role, and question it, because Judaism is based on questions. It's a dialectic, right? And we managed at our at school to produce generations now of young women who were prepared to ask the questions and to look for different answers and to enlighten society on those different answers. And we're now seeing a generation, a completely different generation, particularly in the area of religious practice, of women rabbis, orthodox women rabbis, women decisors laying down the rules of behavior in a way which was undreamt of when I took over the school in 1975. Undreamt of. And among my, my pupils, still those who studied when I was at the school, there are three now who are acknowledged rabbis, ex acknowledged experts, wise women, sages, and although there's still exclusion in the ultra-Orthodox world, and the exclusion in the sense more of separation of roles and functions, but leading to exclusion, particularly in religious practice, in study, and so on, we're seeing now the inroads even into ultra-Orthodox life of what you can only call uh, a a women's liberation movement, the status of women as the income earners in ultra-Orthodox communities is changing the attitude to them. Uh, and I I'm, I'm really feel so privileged to have been able, with my colleagues, uh, it took some persuading. I mean, you know, there's always the core who begin. You have to be prepared at the beginning to face uh, ridicule, to face intense opposition. I mean, I was forced out of my role at the school eventually because I dared to meet Palestinian women at a time when this was forbidden. Uh, but you've laid, you've sown the seeds. And even if you have to leave, I can see now the fruit of those seeds. And I, and there's nothing that can give you greater pleasure, except seeing your own children following in your footsteps with your ideals, with your philosophy, which fortunately is the case with all my children. And I think most of my grandchildren, I uh, haven't got to the great grandchildren yet, they're too young, but I hope they'll also follow that path. That I, I think, um, I think you have to be ready to fight. You have to be ready to face what seems to be temporary defeat or personal defeat, knowing that you've sown the seeds and with the help of whatever force there is about, I don't know how to define that force, I believe there is uh, some superhuman force, with the help of that to see the fruits of your own labors. And I've been blessed. I've been blessed to see that. Alice, you were very successful in your career as an English teacher from the beginning. You very soon moved from teaching language to teaching literature to building the de English department at Ben Gurion University. And then for the first time, you met what we call the glass ceiling. Yes. Being a woman. <laughs> and that's what turned you into a feminist. And I really that think. Was a turning point. <clears throat> I, I lived in with this. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to call it, uh, idiotic idea that I was living in a land of equality, 
uh, for very, I mean, there were good reasons to sense that, you know. Um, unlike in America, uh, women at the university earned the same as men, right? I was shocked to learn that my, my contemporaries equivalents in America were earning less than their male colleagues at university. Women serve in the army like men. Women played a role in the building of the country as members of kibbutzim. And I, I as again, I say I was naive to the extent really of ignorance, right? Uh, so when the position of Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences fell open at the what is now the Ben Gurion University of the Negev, which was just being created at the time. It had been set up only three years earlier, four years earlier, and I had created the English department there. And I had done a, a very good job in establishing the English department. I was very much uh, respected by my fellows, my own level, and I got my promotion to uh, associate professor at that time. Um, and when the dean announced that he was intending to leave the position, I felt fully qualified to take over, and I was interested. I was, it was fascinating to create a new university. I was, again, I was very naive. I thought we'd be able to do something completely new. I didn't realize that there were powers above that would prevent this, although ultimately Ben-Gurion University has been a pioneering university. So I expressed to someone who had a role in deciding who would be the dean, I expressed my interest. And to my surprise, he said, well, yes, go and speak to the necessary people who make the decisions. Uh, and so I went to see the necessary people, the, the rector, the rector in Beersheba, the rector in Jerusalem, which was in charge ultimately, uh, the dean in Jerusalem, the dean there, everywhere, when, when to see, even the directors general, I mean, you know, the administrative heads of both uh, universities. And to my horror, my surprise, I, the first words that came out of the mouth of every single one of them was, but you're a woman. I was so taken aback, you can't imagine. So what? So I'm a woman, that means I, I can't be Dean? And I went back and started speaking to my women colleagues and only then discovered how much more difficult it was for the women to be promoted, how the criteria were different, how even uh, sex was used, uh, sexual harassment was applied very often to graduate students who were being directed by male directors of studies, of course. And that led me to uh, really to speak to my colleagues and to get together. And this was in 1973. Uh, we went together to speak to the rector in Jerusalem uh, and to the president. We met them all and we <laughs> just gave them a whole list of our complaints. And they sat there and the response was, and I believed it, we didn't know. We didn't know, we, we weren't aware. And it made me realize, and made us realize how deeply inbred almost this inequality was. Yes, of course the women served in the army, but there were very few women officers. Right? And the women were doing mainly clerical work 
And there was a lot of clerical work in those days. Now, at least, that they're doing more important work. But the the total um, subjection of women, I would say, to essentially their classical roles as mothers, homemakers, even in the kibbutzim. When I started. When I started traveling around to uh, preach my gospel, as it were, right? and the kibbutz women would say, no, we're totally equal. And I would say, really? How many women have you had in the position of secretary, which is a key position in the, in the kibbutz, right? It's like the president. How many of you have, women have you had as treasurers? No, not really. None. We haven't been any. Where are the women? They're in the kitchen. They're in the children's homes. They're in the laundry. They're doing on a communal level all the work that an ordinary housewife, or give it a nobler name, homemaker, engages in in the home. And it, took, it really took years before we were able to raise sufficient consciousness, it was a good two, three years before there was adequate consciousness among orthodox women, they would say, well, all right, yes, okay, so we're not equal, but that's the way it's supposed to be. But among non-orthodox women, right, how do you explain it? So it was a very interesting process of consciousness raising, also to the fact that there was very little political uh, representation. Yes, we had Golda Meir, but it's very significant. I find it very distressing even that nowadays when people are asked to rank all the prime ministers according to their degree of success, Golda Meir is always at the bottom of the table. And she's, it's not true. I would say that Yitzhak Shamir was far inferior as a prime minister. And I'm sure the fact that Golda was a woman right, leads to her being seen as a failure as a prime minister. And we're very underrepresented now. I mean, I look with great envy at uh, the Scandinavian countries with their degree of equality between the sexes. And I firmly realize there are two factors which in Israel militate against equality of the sexes. One of them is military service, which is still mandatory. And where, although we've seen a great advance in the role of women, because so much warfare, military uh, experience now is technological, where not at the front lines carrying a bayonet or shooting, right? the women are now playing very important roles in very different areas, including the scientific uh, area. Uh, but we were not, it's going to be years before we have a woman chief, it's a chief of staff, right? Or even a woman minister of defense, which should be possible, but because you have to be chief of staff before you can become minister of defense, it's not going to happen soon. So the military service, the centrality of military service and military experience is one reason for continued inequality. And the other is the Jewish religion. Jewish religion simply is not an egalitarian religion. It gives men privilege over women. There are things that only men, according to orthodox religious practice, can do. Right? For example, give the priestly blessing. Right? And you have to remember that we in Israel have an official state religion. We have a state rabbinate. If you don't get married by a state-appointed rabbi, 
you're not officially married. You're registered as a couple, but you can't get divorced. Uh, and until we are able to abolish this government, this rule by the ultra-orthodox within the rabbinate, which is totally unrepresentative of the majority of the population, we're not going to see equality. And one reason why we're not going to see the, the uh, power of the ultra-orthodox diminishing is because they are needed for the, po for the political coalition. No one party will have enough of it, or not, not even a coalition of parties, will have a sufficient majority in the Knesset to be able to do without the ultra-Orthodox. So I'm, unless we have some kind of real revolution in that respect, I'm very pessimistic of our reaching true equality. But there is change. It's gradual. It, you can't stop progress. It's cumulative. It will happen. Not in my time. Perhaps in my children's time. Certainly, I think, by my grandchildren's time. So one has to hope. As I said, our national anthem is hope <laughs> let me turn to one more person who whom we did not mention sufficiently and that's your husband <laughs> and yes and i think you were blessed with a feminist husband Absolutely. and i really think that your husband moshe deserves to be mentioned here oh, and he also his contribution yeah. to Absolutely. the revolution that you initiated I actually I I'm so blessed. I this this really I could never, never, never have done what I did without his support, without his encouragement. And there's an interesting history behind my husband. Um he he had a brother two years younger than himself who was born with a spinal defect and was actually confined to bed all his life. He died at the age of 18, but he was in and out of hospital a great deal. My mother-in-law had to spend a lot of time taking care of him. And my father-in-law was a traveling salesman. He was home very little. He came home only really for the weekend for Shabbat and then he for the Sabbath and then he slept a lot after in addition to going to synagogue he was a deeply profoundly orthodox religiously orthodox man but he didn't do anything in the household and so Moshe became his mother's helper and she used to tell with great pride the story of when she had sent him to buy peas at the greengrocer and he took a very long time he was about five years old and he came back and she asked him why he, it had taken him so long to buy a pound of peas and he said well i felt every pod to make sure that it was full of peas and that i wasn't bringing home empty pots. Now, clearly, this experience of helping his mother, seeing his mother cope with the entire household burden that included an invalid son, had a deep, deep influence on him. And when I first met him, and for me, it was really love at first sight, uh, and I, he did not instantly respond. But on one of the first evenings we were together in a group, when I suggested he come to a concert, he said, no, he had to go back home in order to darn his socks. It, this was at a time of acute clothing uh, shortage. 
right? You didn't throw away socks the way you do now. You darned socks. And I said, quite honestly, I'm very good at darning socks. If you come to the concert tonight, I'll come tomorrow evening and darn your socks. And that was it. And within uh, less than three months, we were engaged. And uh, we met in May, and in October, we were married. <laughs> and he remained really my rod and my staff. He was my support. He defended me. When people attacked me, he defended me. When I spoke in public and said things that made remarks that people in the audience didn't like, I remember on one occasion an angry man walking towards me and Moshe standing in front of him and flinging out his arms saying, don't you dare touch my wife, right? <laughs> um, he, was, he was everything that a woman could wish for, that a man could wish for in a partner. It was a true partnership. And I'm happy to say that I was able to help him in his career as well, but nothing like as much as he helped me. There's no doubt that I owe him the greatest debt possible. And uh, the number of my women friends who say in envy, I wish I had a Moshe in my life, <laughs> in, in, innumerable. And uh, I'm very happy to say that I see this kind of partnership repeated in my sons who as husbands are also following in their father's tradition of being true helpmates. I think that this is a very nice ending and it's much more optimistic than you were before. Yes. So I think, <laughs> so I think this is the no, point. I think, <laughs> you know, I think this, I, th I would make a distinction, you know. Um, one has to be, one has to remain optimistic. I'm essentially optimistic. Sometimes I think I must be a fool for being optimistic, <laughs> but it doesn't help to be pessimistic. And if you remain optimistic, you at least remain positive and you go on being active and trying to bring about the future that you dream of. Whereas if you sink into pessimism, it becomes nihilism. So yes, you have to remain optimistic. And I remain optimistic. But, and <laughs> I, I hope for better days. They could yeah. hardly be much worse. Perhaps <laughs> if we had more women running the world, perhaps. Well, be let's different. hope for the best. Yes. Abby, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for your optimism and thank you for this wonderful interview and stay healthy. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And you stay healthy. Thanks. That's a general wish now. Goodbye. Yes. Goodbye. <laughs>